Hi, VJ. Hi, nice to see you. Nice, nice to see you uh, as well. You know, it's always a, a pleasure, even if it's uh, only uh, virtually. I, actually, I never do this. I don't. I never do like self promotion stuff. But as we have written a book together, I will do it today. You know, the last time we we spoke for hours was for this book, and I love it. And I loved these conversations with you. And it started like this, in a way. It was during COVID. We just started by a conversation and then another one and another one. And then it ended up uh, making a book. But anyway. And, and know, it's really yeah. interesting because, you know, just before we are speaking now, our friend and comrade Fred Mbembe was in prison in Lusaka, Zambia, uh, very unfairly detained. He should have received bail immediately. But while he was in prison, he took this book with him to the jail cell and he read it during his incarceration. Um, afterwards, of course, he called and said, well, it was, you know, great and so on. But I'm thinking of all the books to take to prison, I would have chosen <laughs> Graham Greene or, you know, whatever, John Le Carre. But he picked um, Struggle Makes Us Human. So that's hey, uh, ten, uh, 10 points to Fred. <laughs> 10 points. It's an honor. Yeah. But anyway, so I wanted to talk to you again uh, today. I mean, there's so much we can talk about, um, and in particular, what's happening in, in Gaza. But in a way, I've been focusing on this uh, with a lot of my guests. And um, But I wanted to talk to you um, uh, especially about Venezuela, mm -hmm. because you are based in uh, South America. You're actually in Santiago de, Ch de Chile now. But uh, you were in Venezuela before, during and after the uh, July 28th elections, there was, there was a lot happening, you know, before, during uh, and after the election. And I was wondering um, how, how did the, the country, how did the people feel during these like few weeks? You know, it's one of those things, Frank, I first went to Venezuela in the 1990s. This is between the period of the Caracazo, the big uprising, anti-international monetary fund uprising. There were a series of them around the world. We were calling them bread riots. You know, people just saying, we can't eat, you know, we can't, um, we can't survive. The price of gasoline is so high and so on. Austerity imposed by the IMF. Um, between the IMF riots so the Caracazo, where the people of Caracas, uh, you know, exploded in rebellion in 1989 and the victory for the first time of Hugo Chavez and his massive coalition in 1998. I visited Caracas, saw the immense wealth produced by oil, you know, um, since the discovery of oil and then increasingly so, Venezuela has been about 95 percent reliant on oil revenues for its state income. That, in fact, it's not just the state income. It's really for the economy because the state plays a very large role. And it was very clear in the 1990s, enormous wealth, but enormous, unbelievable um, levels of inequality. Um, you know, the poor living on the hillsides and so on. Well, it is exactly that that, that Hugo Chavez appealed to. He appealed to the people living in the hills, the outsiders, um, the people who had been left behind in the great oil rush. You know, an earlier oil minister, um, Perez Alfonso, wrote a book where he talked about oil as the devil's excrement, you know, the shit of the devil, uh, because it produces wealth and inequality in equal measure. And this is what Chavez wanted to uh, turn around. He wanted to bring this oil wealth, um, you know, to bear against uh, inequality, to help the people who were suffering. He was inspired by by the traditions of the left, by radical Christianity, and so on. So, in fact, what Chavez did in 1998 is opened up a two-line struggle that defines the mood of, of Venezuela till today. On the one side are the large sections of the poor who believe now that the world can be actually a better place. They can actually build their houses. They can actually, um, you know, get enough income to survive, whereas previously they were struggling. And the other side that wants to return to the pre-Chavez era, 
Um, you know, these are the two lines of struggle. And I've been to several elections in Venezuela. It's not just elections. I've been to several elections. But generally in Venezuela, this is the mood. There is a section that says that the world can be better for us despite the problems in the state and, you know, the sanctions and all of that. And the other side that says we want to return to the pre-Chavez era. That's the mood. It's been the mood for 20 some years now. That's the mood. And it's unchanged. It's extraordinary. After the election, the big mass rallies of the Chavistas, they were chanting the phrase, no volveran, we will not return, which is directly a statement uh, about going back before Chavez. So that was the mood, Frank. It's been the mood and that's the mood. Okay, I, I want you to ask you a question that might sound a bit like simple or stupid. Or, but, but who is Nicolas Maduro? Because a lot of people have heard about Hugo Chavez. Uh, Chavez. Um, a lot of people have heard about Nicolas Maduro. But who is, who is he in terms of the successor of, of Chavez? It's interesting. You know, when you look at presidents, let's just take Latin America. You know, most of them come from pretty elite families. They come from either upper middle class or, or genuinely oligarchic families. There's a set of names that you expect to be in high political life, you know. Um, and then you get these breakthroughs. Hugo Chavez was, of course, a, a lower middle class a peasant family that went to the military and then emerges from there. He himself was a real break from the previous presidents. They all had names that are identifiable. You know, th these are... There are old Creole aristocracies in these societies. And there's a set of names of people that you expect to be the presidents. And they repeat, you know, every once in a while. Chavez was a breakthrough. Well, Maduro was even more a breakthrough. Maduro comes from a working class family, was a bus driver, um, goes into left politics as a young person, becomes a trade union leader, uh, you know, in the bus driver's union. And he comes before Chavez as a real um, force of nature. You know, Chavez saw him as somebody very reliable, interesting, and so on. And he made him his foreign minister. So during most of Chavez's tenure as president, Nicolas Maduro was his foreign minister. And I remember him in that role, um, struggling, you know, in effect to balance a very difficult situation in the world because um, in most of this period, Mr. Chavez was under attack. You know, there was an attempted coup, which actually took place for several hours in 2002. Maduro was holding the ball. When Chavez was diagnosed um, with um, cancer and he was in, in Havana, he, at the time, his son-in-law, Jorge Ariaza, uh, was with him. And, and, of course, Fidel Castro. And at one point, he called Ariaza and said, you know, go to Caracas and bring Nicolas to me. Because, you know, if anything happens to me, Nicolas has to hold the revolution intact. And in a sense, he bequeathed the, you know, the, the baton to Maduro. Now, what's interesting is Chavez dies in 2013, very young, you know, when he died, very young and extraordinarily popular. But um, Nicolas Maduro takes over in an interim capacity. They go to elections. Now, this election campaign, 2013, is very interesting, Frank, because, you see, oil prices start to decline. There's already privations from previous sanctions against Venezuela by the United States government. Um, Maduro has to take over an election campaign from the greatest campaigner I've ever seen in my life. I mean, I've watched Hugo Chavez in rallies. You know, this guy... He can talk, he, he reaches into the heart of people, talks a popular kind of language. Um, every once in a while would break into song. He's not a great singer, but he would sing rancheras, you know, from Mexico or from the, from the plains area of, of Venezuela where he was raised, you know, the Barinas area. He would break into popular songs. He would tell stories for hours. Um, he would explain things about cattle and about their breeding cycle. You know, he was a peasant leader. He understood that. He was also extraordinarily well-read. He knew the life of Simon Bolivar, Simon Rodriguez. You know, he knew the lives of the founders. So he would, at great length, in these campaign rallies, talk about, you know, this is what Bolivar wrote to his beloved wife, and he'd talk about a letter. 
to take over from Hugo Chavez, Frank, it's, uh, you know, it's like, it's like when John Lennon died in the Beatles, Frank Barat was invited to take over lead guitar um, in the Beatles. I mean, I don't know how well um, you would be able to fit in John Lennon's shoes, but to follow Chavez is extraordinary. That itself is extraordinary. Secondly, the oil price problem. Now, he goes into the presidential can ca campaign and it was extremely tight. Mr. Maduro won 51% of the vote. Uh, Capriles, Henry Capriles, the person for the opposition, won 49. It's extremely tight. When I saw that result, it became clear to me, um, this is in 2013-14, that that's about the base of the, of the Chavez movement. It's roughly 50 plus 1%. 51, maybe 52 percent. That's that's where it is, because these are the hardcore Chavistas. These are the people who are darker than the rest of the country. They are shorter than the rest of the country and they are poorer than the rest of the country. And they are devoted to the Bolivarian process. It's very difficult to get less than 50 percent, you know, for 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 a Chavismo process, e even though the privations are immense. Um, and Mr. Maduro, therefore, from a very difficult standpoint, had to hold on to the reins of this process. The attacks by the United States became more ferocious, including against him on his life, and oil prices continued to decline. And because oil prices declined, the physical plant of their infrastructure also declined. And you might be surprised to know that Venezuelan oil is processed off offshore, which means they have to export crude and import uh, petroleum. That means that even though they are a petroleum rich, uh, oil rich country, crude rich country, they have to actually import petroleum. So the burdens on the exchequer are enormous. And despite that, they have struggled to survive. And I, I really, sometimes I don't know how they did it. Who is Nicolas Maduro? He is the successor of Hugo Chavez. Was that a job he wanted? I don't think so. I don't think anybody wanted to be the immediate successor of somebody as charismatic and extraordinary as Hugo Chavez. So now, now that you've told us who is Nicolas Maduro, who is his opponent, um, Edmundo Gonzalez? Where is he coming from? You know, who is he? Well, he is not the opponent. Um, he is the marionette in a way. The real opponent is Marie Corina Machado. Marie Corina Machado is a woman of the far right. Uh, this is, and, and you've got to understand, the far right in Venezuela are really right wing. This is the oligarchic far right. This is not really the new right. You know, this is not uh, young people who go to university, who read, you know, Friedrich Hayek or who read Milton Friedman, who are converts to this stuff. She comes from a rich old family. And, you know, from the beginning, she opposed Mr. Chavez for, for a number of reasons, but principally because he expropriated wealth of the very rich people, sections of the wealth, not all of it. Um, and also he fully uh, privatized the oil company. So Marie Corina Machado, from early on, has because she knows, you know, they know, these people know that there's no way to get above 50 percent for somebody like her for a couple of reasons. But one of them is she's known for a long time that the Chavez movement is deeply popular. There was a very special moment in the National Assembly where she stood up and she challenged Hugo Chavez to a debate. You know, this is when she was a younger um, uh, Congress person in the Assembly. And she challenges Chavez to this debate and Chavez responds saying, the eagle does not debate the fly. You know, I mean, this is... Um, the understanding of interesting about the right in that kind of society where this big, um, you know, uh, constituency has been built is she knows that the right wing just can't win above 50 percent. And the re reason she knows that in 2004, so two years after the attempted coup against Chavez, there was a recall referendum the right wing put forward a recall to try to recall Chavez. And knowing that, knowing very well that this was going to fail because he is extraordinarily popular um, right through his life, knowing that this is going to fail, they started to talk about fraud. And they said before the election, they started to say there's going to be fraud. So 
this fraud narrative has come up since 2004 in every election. Um, every election, the right wing has, has said there's fraud. But when I've talked to people of the right, like, you know, the traditional right wing, COPE, Action Democratica, and so on, they tell you directly, look, there's two reasons that the Bolivarians still now, that is to say till 2024, will have a hard time losing an election, is one, they have a massive base. Like they have over a million people in the communes that up to 90% will vote for whoever the Bolivarians put up. Um, they have a base in the countryside. They have extraordinarily well-organized election machine. They go out there and bring their supporters to vote. I mean, you go to these housing projects, which were all built during the Bolivarian period, and you'll see women sitting at the entrance to the housing project, just noting down who all are going to vote. And if they don't, they go and call them. So they have an enormous election machine. The right has nothing like that. And secondly, it's ideology. Marie Corina Machado's uh, politics are to privatize the oil industry and to take back the wealth that had been expropriated. How are you going to stand in front of 10, 15 million poor people and say, we want to take back what Chavez took from us and gave to you? So for these reasons, the right just cannot win. Well, Marie Corina Machado herself uh, was going to run in the election. But because she has openly talked about U.S. intervention, she actually became a delegate for Panama in the Organization of American States. All of this is illegal. She's a Venezuelan citizen. So they barred her from electioneering because she's, she's committed treason, called for the overthrow of her government in a foreign intervention, and she took Panamanian um, diplomatic status to go to the OAS. So she was barred. So they found a replacement for her. It's Edmundo Gonzalez. He's an interesting character because he's a diplomat. They tried to portray him as a grandfather. The fact is, A, he's super uncharismatic. Uh, but the next thing, and, and also detached from working people. I mean, whatever one thinks of Maduro, the guy is a master campaigner. I mean, he goes there, he plays the drums, he dances. You know, he does the things one has to do uh, in a in a campaign, in a kind of democratic campaign. He goes among the people, he hugs everybody. Gonzalez is, is much more patrician, you know, in his physicalness. But also in the 1970s, he was in the diplomatic corps. In the 80s, he was sent to El Salvador to work at the Venezuelan embassy there under a very disreputable guy who was running for the El Salvador government a project for torturing uh, the... FMLN fighters who had been kidnapped. And one woman, Nadia Diaz, recounts being tortured in a prison and there being Venezuelan torturers in the room. Nobody knows that Edmund Gonzalez personally did this, but he worked in that project. So these are disreputable people, the people of the right. They're not liberals, okay? So let nobody believe that this is like socialists versus the liberals. This is the socialists versus the hard right. Really disreputable characters. So, I mean, listening to you, um, the opposition said that it got, it got more than 8 million votes, which would be more than what Chavez got in 2012. Does this number make any sense to you? Well, it's interesting. So before the election, the election took place on Chavez's birthday, which, you know, I think is a little unfair to the opposition, but it's another day in the year. Um, so... Before this date, the ambassadors from various Latin American countries were calling up the government officials with whom they had contact. So, for instance, one of them kept calling a vice minister um, who runs Latin America on behalf of the Venezuelan foreign ministry and asking them, when will the actors or the polling papers be released? This is weird because nobody's ever asked this question before. And actors are not released. There's Venezuelan procedure and laws. I went and looked at it. In fact, uh, there's a procedure which we could get into the weeds of this if you want. It's not that interesting. But generally, polling documents are not released online. You know, what you get is tabulations. I mean, in, let's say, you know, you're in Belgium. Belgium has an election. Do they release every polling station's document which shows um, how many people there were, who voted for what? And in fact, going down to really 
who in this house voted for which candidate i mean it's a violation of the secrecy of elections it's a weird question okay so there was all this happening before the election on the 20th of july now just a few days before the 20th a poll was released now there were many polls actually released right wing newspapers and people should know that venezuela has a lot the most of the media is right of center right wing newspapers were doing these polls on twitter you know super reliable right asking their followers who are you going to vote for well everybody knows those polls are junk polling in fact is not a science in venezuela there really isn't a reputable polling agency or anything well the poll that was being referred to by everybody including maricorina machado edmundo gonzales the newspapers in the united states and so on the poll was done by a group called edison research which is based in new jersey edison research now if you go to their website there's two things of note about edison research number one thing of note is that edison research does a lot of uh, polls and other kind of things for cia contractors for instance radio free europe um you know this that the other i mean it's a very interesting list they only seem to do research for cia contractors that's one interesting thing now that doesn't mean they didn't decide to do this poll for somebody else i just don't know i would like to know who was their client uh, that asked them to do this poll separate question maybe frank barat should call up edison research and say hello i'm doing a story um who was your client seems like nobody has asked them in fact i tried to ring them didn't get an answer interesting phone was not picked up by anybody does anybody exist at the other end i don't know second interesting thing when you visit their website is you'll find the poll it's there now i mean i don't i'm not a sophologist i don't do a lot of polling i do read data but i don't do or make data but i have a general idea from being a social scientist what data is like when you go to their poll they just have the result they say that the opposition is going to win 70% the chavistas around 30% what they don't have is methodology they don't have any sense of the sample was it nationwide was it conducted by the telephone who did the polling there's no information in other words it's merely the result no methodology this is highly suspicious and they said 70% to the opposition now if i asked even the most um you know hardcore opposition person privately like do you think you'd get 70% i very much doubt that they would agree to the 70% number and you are very correct to raise this question like would they have got more votes than chavez got in 2012 it's very unlikely of course there was a anti socialist anti maduro vote that existed but it's very unlikely that that vote would have gone 25% uh, of the electorate was voting against the government i doubt it very much um and there's a couple of reasons why i doubt it one the uh, safe hands of the opposition in other words the more credible people privately say to you that look we couldn't break the 50% barrier secondly in the marches and demonstrations after the election it was pretty clear that the marches and demonstrations done by maricorina machado and there were many of them most of the people on the streets for her were middle class there was some working class presence but it was not significant working class presence to indicate uh, that there was a change of mood and at the pro maduro rallies there was a vast working class presence now working class um protests are always smaller than middle class protests principally because it's harder to get there you don't have vehicles public transport is not always available and so on nonetheless the next day the day after the election there were thousands of people marching down the street almost spontaneously you know even though the opposition was conducting acts of violence motorcycles driving here and there smashing things up and so on the government side didn't conduct violence i mean there were arrests uh, and i i am mean, sure we'll talk about that but but that's different from the kind of random violence of throwing things around i was staying in a hotel where there were a number of election observers and there were opposition motorcycles sitting opposite very threateningly as if they were going to come in and start you know roughing up i mean there were election observers at the election 
um, you know, the CNE, which is their council for elections. And they were surrounded by opposition gang um, wanting to beat them up. I mean, it was a tough bunch of days. So, yeah, yes, there was a poll. Uh, yes, 70% um, to the opposition. Yes, that seemed entirely the tricks that I've seen many times from Langley, much less from, um, you know, I mean, the people of Venezuela. So what is um, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken talking about when he said very quickly, a few days after the election, that there was overwhelming evidence that Gonzalez won? What, what evidence was he talking about? And in a way, I'll put the other question right next to it. And historically, why is the U.S., why does the U.S. seems to be so interested in Venezuela? You know, are they like, um, you know, neutral observer in the region? Well, let's go to um, the evidence. So, you know, there, look, every country has its procedures. Now, you can, you can debate the procedures. Venezuela, there's a procedure. Um, there's a, you know, electoral council. They have their own um, set of things that they do. You can actually go to the council as a political party and make an appeal. Other parties did, not the opposition. They decided not to. Um, you know, the Socialist Party went and they presented their evidence. And that was an internal review by the election body. Now, when there was more questions asked, uh, Mr. Maduro personally went with the, on behalf of the Socialist Party to the Supreme Court of Venezuela and asked for an investigation. The opposition decided to boycott the court. Now, I understand the Chavistas have been in power since 1998. I understand that. The Supreme Court you know, is ma basically mainly nominated by the Chavistas. It's going to have an orientation like that. I understand that. But if you look at the biography of the judges, they've all had a career that spans from before the Chavez movement takes power. These are people with long histories. They are not, you know, like sort of just sort of activists who are on the court. These are jurists. Okay. And then they eventually looked at the evidence. By the way, the opposition boycotted it. They looked at the evidence and they said, well, the election is looks fine. And they certified it for Mr. Maduro. Now, you know, for the United States to talk about elections and the Supreme Court is extraordinary. Because you may remember there was a court uh, case, Bush versus Gore, where George Bush was running against Al Gore the election was tied up around Florida. And rather than allow the U.S. people to decide, the U.S. Supreme Court picked the winner. So it's a bit rum for the United States to say, you know, why is the court getting involved? Oh, my God, the U.S. Supreme Court has gotten involved in elections more than that one occasion. Now, initially, of course, the United States was very interested in Venezuela because of the oil. Um, that was the interesting thing. It has one of the world's largest reserves of crude oil. U.S. doesn't need this oil for itself. It's a net exporter of oil. But Venezuela's volume helps to control oil prices. It helps to control who gets uh, oil for what. But eventually, they began to really turn on Venezuela because Mr. Chavez was not just, you know, deciding what to do with the oil, but he was deciding to take the oil and to build a kind of socialism and Latin American integration. This had to be overthrown. This was unacceptable. Okay, so that's what was happening then. Eventually, they felt that this is a communist regime. It has to be overthrown like Cuba. Um, there was John Bolton during the period of Donald Trump who said this is the um, axis of tyranny and it has to be overthrown. He was talking about Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua. That was John Bolton. Um, okay, that was that period. You see, now it's an interesting story. Because now it's not just about Venezuela and the United States. It's about Europe. Um, you know, and this is, I think, interesting to, to people who may not have understood this well. Europe is in a real crisis. The United States, by its own policy, and I think the French participated in one of these, um, the U.S. policy cut Europe off from its three main oil and natural gas suppliers. First, it was Iran where the United States forced essentially the break with Iran, sanctions policy 2006. Then the United States goes and destroys Libya with France in 2011 and NATO. So Libya, which was a principal supply of oil, offline and continues to be offline. 
and then after the um, incident around first Georgia when the sanctions begin and then in 2008 and then the Maidan incidents in Ukraine in 2014, they cut Russia off. When Russia invades Ukraine, they say no more oil or natural gas. The, somebody blows up, somebody blows up Nord Stream 2 pipeline and so on. Europe is desperate for energy. Um, the United States has substituted um, Russian, Iranian and Libyan energy by providing liquefied natural gas. Super expensive, much more expensive than pipe gas from Russia. They want Venezuelan oil on the market to supply Europe. In fact, um, in 2022, United States gave extraordinary licenses to an Italian and Spanish um, shipping companies to carry Venezuelan oil to Spain and, and therefore to Europe. They're desperate. And that's the reason why the United States uh, brokered a deal in Barbados between the opposition and the Maduro government. It's called the Barbados Agreement. The hope was that if this election could be so-called free and fair, I mean, certified not by the Venezuelan Supreme Court, but by the United States government, if it could be free and fair, then the oil can start flowing and sanctions will drop. Um, the problem is the U.S. is desperate for the oil. They would have sanctioned, they would have certified this election free and fair regardless. Mari Corina Machado and the right wing have been to some extent orphaned by the United States government. And they are desperate to pull the U.S. back in, including through all kinds of interventions. And they very cleverly boxed in the OAS and they made a big drama about this whole thing about fraud in the election to such an extent that they put Brazil's um, Mr. President Lula and Colombia's President Petro into a bind and dragged them into this. Um, so that now they are also kind of stuck calling for things to be released which go against Venezuelan law. I mean, the only sensible person here seems to be Mexico's president, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, who says, look, you know, here's our Mexican constitution. We are not supposed to intervene in a foreign country's affairs, let alone in its elections. Um, they seem to have the elections under control. Uh, why are we interfering and saying there should either be a repeat or not? Because listen... This is first they came for. First they came for the Venezuelans. Next they'll come for the Colombians. Next election in Colombia, who's to say if Petro wins that they come and say, sorry, you didn't win. There was fraud. I mean, this is a very dangerous playbook. And for some odd reason, Lula and Petro and, well, Boric is a different story, are all walking down this road. And, and I don't get it. But the main fact is the U.S. government would really like Venezuelan oil on the market. And they really don't care if it's Maduro's hand on the tiller or Marie Corina Machado. They would prefer Marie Corina Machado. Uh, but I think right now their desperation around Ukraine is this. And if the Germans start to cut their support for Ukraine, the pressure to level the field with Venezuela is going to increase. Okay, so uh, it'll be my last question. So... In your opinion, what's going to, I mean, you've exposed a few potential, you know, avenues, but what's going to happen next? You see, one of the things to bear in mind is that that government in Venezuela is extremely resilient. Um, over the last period, Frank, we just have seen a series of failures when it's come to serious regime change. I mean, the United States with everybody, the Turks, the um, the Gulf Arabs, the Saudis, the Egyptians, everybody couldn't overthrow the government in Syria. You know, they just couldn't do it. Everybody was ganged up except the Iranians and the Russians on the side of the Syrians. They couldn't do it. They couldn't overthrow the government in Yemen. Ansar Allah remains in power. Uh, they just couldn't do it. You know, I mean, it, they, they, they tried several times to overthrow the government in, in Bolivia. Uh, in fact, they did do the coup in 2019. It was reversed. They just couldn't do it. They tried. They did a coup against Manuel Zelaya in 2009. Eventually, the Zelayaistas come back to power. I mean, if I, if you look around the world, the United States in an earlier era used to be able to exercise power much easily. Now it's difficult. And right after this election, I was very interested to see not only Russia, Iran, Turkey, and so on 
immediately recognized Mr. Maduro. But so did China. This is extraordinary. Normally, the Chinese sort of hold back and wait. This time, they recognized Maduro the next day, very quickly. So I feel like, you know, this is not going to work out very well for the far right. It's not going to work out well for the United States. The real challenge isn't whether the far right is going to prevail now. The real challenge is what is the Maduro government going to be able to do um, to basically settle some of the enduring problems that exist in the country. You know, sanctions has created its own problems. I mean, they, they had to privatize parts of the economy to allow basic goods and services to come in because the government was sanctioned. So you had to privatize to survive. But now what will they do? You know, how will they use whatever income comes in from the selling of oil uh, to change the balance of forces in the country? I mean, Mr. Maduro's job is not going to be made easy whether he wins or not. You know, he personally is an extraordinarily nice person. Um, and nobody wants this job, Frank. Nobody wants to be at the helm, you know, the, the figurehead being smashed by the U.S. government. You know, calumnied in the world press, called a dictator. Nobody wants this, you know, especially not somebody like that. You are stuck with it. I mean, he was given this in a very difficult inheritance by Hugo Chavez, you know, but he is stuck with it. And he is going to have to figure out how to actually assist his base who are struggling. Um, you know, the right wing wants to say they are struggling because of corruption. The left says they are struggling because of sanctions. Nobody is disagreeing that the people are struggling. How they are going to have to come out of this, I think, is a real challenge for the government. And, and let's see what happens, Frank, because I don't think the government is going to fall now. I don't think the right has any mechanism. I don't think the United States is willing to militarily intervene. They, they're waiting for Iran to respond um, you know, uh, in one way or the other in the Middle East. They're still ramping up pressure in China, they're still refusing to allow peace in Ukraine. I doubt they want another war uh, anywhere in the world, let alone in Venezuela, where, where they would have to fight street by street because there are six, eight million Chavistas who are going to you know, throw their garbage at the marching U.S. troops. They're not going to allow them uh, an easy run. So this is going to be complicated. And you know, for people on the left, I would just like to say directly that I understand, you know, people have all kinds of critiques of Mr. Maduro and whatnot of the Venezuelan process. But I'd like you to know quite plainly that if the United States succeeds in Venezuela, the Cuban revolution is in deep distress. Uh, so don't imagine that you can somehow be, you know, for the Cuban revolution, but you have mixed feelings about Venezuela. There, are, there is a global balance of forces and let's not be naive about this. Thanks, BJ. As Thanks usual. a lot, Frank. Thank you, Looking comrade. Looking forward to having a beer with you at Mani Fiesta. Oh, yeah. Okay.